Soldier's Heart by Alex 51324 Chapter 3 April to May 1915 I'm sure he's fine, said Maud bravely. All the doctors and medics know their job, like Thomas's friend. She looked at him hopefully and Thomas found himself saying, They do. They'll take good care of him. Even though his mind was full of things Peter had told him, that infection killed more men than the wounds themselves, that once the gas gangrene started, there was nothing to do but amputate, and once it reached the trunk, nothing to do at all, that sometimes there were just too many wounded to look after them all. Then there was the fact that Maud's mother had had an official telegram saying that Henry was wounded. They didn't send those out for a scratch. If the man was well enough to sign his name, he sent a field postcard. Across the table, he and O'Brien exchanged a look almost like the old days. He wondered if her brother told her things most men didn't tell their women folk. Miss Hughes, giving Maud a last motherly pat on the shoulder, changed the subject. And how is Mr. Fitzroy faring? They have him at an advanced dressing station now, Thomas said. Is that where they do the more complicated treatments? Another maid asked. Thomas shook his head. That's a stationary hospital. Advanced means towards the front. Oh, said the maid. They'd moved Peter up quickly once he'd left the base hospital. A couple of weeks at the CCS, a couple at the main dressing station, and now this. Each one was a bit closer to the fighting, a bit more dangerous, and a lot less comfortable. They're in the same part of the lines as the gun batteries. The artillery, you know. So it's very loud. Not just loud, either. Anna asked, Do you want guns shoot further than the German ones? No, oh, said Bates. They don't. They don't get shelled very often, Thomas said quickly. Peter had said so. Our guns are mostly positioned to be in range of their front lines and the other way around. But sometimes. Do they still have to go up to the front and collect the wounded? Madge asked. Like they did at his last place. Thomas nodded. They've always got to do that. Bates said, we used to have men seconded from the regiment to act as stretcher bearers. They still do that, Thomas told him, but the ones from the dressing stations have to go too, if there's more than a few wounded at one time. Bates shook his head and sighed. It was something of a light duty in our war. They'd put you on it if you were getting over being sick or something. Not long ago, Thomas would have thought Bates was calling him a liar. Peter says they put you on extra collecting parties. That's what it's called. If you're in trouble... Otherwise, there's a rotor. But if you're being punished, you've got to go every time. It was inhuman, he thought, punishing somebody by putting them in risk of death. But Peter never got in trouble, so that was good for him. He didn't have to go as often. 14th of April, 1915. Dear Thomas, I have not been very brave today. I told you before about the sound of the guns and how it makes the war seem so close. Even though there are guns and no danger to us here. They creep into my dreams and seem louder every day. I woke up and got up for a smoke and found our M.O. Captain R. doing the same. He's the nice one I told you about. So I asked him if there was any way I could be rotated back for a bit. Just to get away from the guns, I said. It wasn't about not wanting my share of the dangerous work. He was very nice about it and said he understood, but there simply wasn't a mechanism for it. We are already nearly as far back as the men go when they're rotated off the front for a rest, so the army doesn't see any need to rotate us out. It was a shame, he said, because it would do all of us a lot of good to get away for a bit. Some of the M.O.s, he said, think maybe the roar of the guns does something to your inner ear, makes you a bit potty if you're susceptible, but you're bound to adjust eventually. He was trying not to make me feel like a coward for asking, but I still do. Also, we had a lecture on war neurosis a while ago. The first line treatment is for one's officer to kindly but firmly tell one to buck up. I'm fairly certain I have just received this treatment. Light a cigarette for me, your neurotic friend. P.F. Thomas struggled with how to reply to this letter. His first impulse was to tell Peter he was an idiot for drawing attention to himself when he was having trouble. He might have been able to wrangle something somehow, but now if he tried, they'd know what he was doing. But he couldn't say that to Peter, not if he was still feeling low when he got the letter. And in any case, it was too late now. He didn't even really want to say it, not to Peter, who was so brave and clever and kind. That left him with no clear idea of what to say instead, though. Anna told him that the best thing to say was that Peter was very brave, 
and he was sure that the officer hadn't thought otherwise, but they weren't in the habit of telling each other comforting lies. In the end, he wrote, Dear Peter, I'm not surprised you're having trouble. It all sounds wretched. Remember that you are very brave to have gone there in the first place, and I expect it's true that lots of men are having a hard time, otherwise Captain R would not have had a lecture ready about it. If he has any sense, he will tell the superiors what he thinks about it being a good idea to rotate the orderlies off from time to time. Who knows, something may come of it. After all, you are at the front. The back of the front, but still. I worry about you being there, of course. At church last Sunday, we had a prayer for our boys fighting at the front, and I wanted to point out to Father What's-His-Name that there are people at the front doing things other than fighting, and they're having as bad a time of it as anyone else. I did not give in to this impulse, just talked Bates and Anna's ears off about it. Everything here continues as normal. Bates' mother is ill, which is no surprise given she's about 900 years old. I have been good and told him it's no trouble doing his work while he goes down to London to see her. So far, he hasn't gone. Lighting lots and lots of cigarettes for you. TB. The next morning's post brought nothing from Peter, but it did bring something. An envelope of smooth, heavy paper. Expensive paper. Addressed in a hand that used to send a thrill through him whenever he saw it. He didn't even have to open it to know what sort of news it would be. There was only one reason the owner of that hand and that paper would be writing to him now. The only question was who it was about. Numbly, he slit the envelope, took out the letter, and read, Thomas, I hope this letter finds you well. I'm sure you must be surprised to hear from me after all this time. I'm writing because I came across a piece of news that might interest you and of which you may not have heard. I'm sorry to have to tell you that Elliot Cavendish was killed in action in France the week before last. I don't know any further details than that. I had it from his people. I got the impression that you and he were rather chummy at one time, so I thought that you might like to know. Sodding hell, Elliot, of all people. Thomas! He glanced up to see Carson glaring at him, his expression thunderous. What? How dare you use language like that in mixed company? I'm sorry, Mr. Carson, he heard himself saying. I didn't realize I was speaking aloud. Excuse me. He got up and headed for the courtyard, vaguely aware of a commotion behind him. Elliot. He was a break, of course, all of them were, but he'd been the first man in Thomas's life to say that he'd loved him. They hadn't spoken in years. And now he was dead. I'll go and speak to him. Anna said quickly, it wouldn't do it all for Mr. Carson to go after him. Heaven knew what Thomas would say. He must have gotten some distressing news, Mr. Bates explained to the rest as Anna left the room. She wasn't at all surprised to find Thomas in the courtyard smoking. She was a little surprised that he was crying, too. What happened? she asked. It couldn't be Mr. Fitzroy. He not have managed to leave the room as calmly as he had if it was. But what else could have set him enough to swear at breakfast? Thomas wiped angrily at his eyes. Nothing. Just some complete brat I used to know. But he handed her the letter he'd been reading, and she was surprised to recognize the crest at the top. And the handwriting. Lady Mary used to get letters on this paper? In that handwriting? Why on earth was Thomas getting letters from the Duke of Crowborough? The center was a surprise, but the contents were what she had guessed they must be. Someone had died. Someone who, somehow, Thomas and the Duke both knew. Belatedly, she remembered what Liesel and Mr. Fitzroy had hinted at when they'd talked in Kew Gardens that spring, about Thomas having a bit of a past involving gentlemen who hadn't treated him very well. I'm sorry, she said hesitantly. He shook his head. I don't care about him. It's just that I get one of those about every week these days. I don't know if you've heard, but... And then they tell me who's been killed this time. Not any of my real mates yet, just... People I've lost touch with, like Elliot, or friends of friends. But it makes you worry about Mr. Fitzroy, Anna said gently. Of course it did. But he looked up at her and said crossly, It's not like he's the only friend I've got. There's a bunch of them over there now. Joey, Sil and Theo, Reg, 
He had never mentioned any of these people before, as far as she could remember, and part of her wanted to point out that he couldn't really expect the rest of them to know what friends he'd got if he kept it all such a big secret. But he was going on. Michael's not there yet, but he's going, and so's Drew. Don't really know Drew, he's new, but he seems like a nice lad. Shame to think of him dead. The other Peter's already dead, and so is one of the Danes. I'm not sure which one. And Tim. You know about Eddie, he was killed back at the beginning. Haven't heard from Joey in over a month. Got worried enough, I asked around. Nobody else has either. I wouldn't be surprised if he's dead too. And George Hargraves, Charles, and now Elliot. God only knows how many I haven't heard about. The Tovs, the Ryan Droves. A lot have at least got the sense to try and keep their heads down. How did he know all these people? She knew he got a lot of letters, but he always seemed so aloof, so isolated. It must be very worrying, she said tentatively. I should probably go, he said, and for a moment she thought he meant back inside, which would have been wise. It was a damp, chilly morning, and he hadn't stopped to put on a coat. There's not much point in me being the only one left, is there? Me and Philip. He's got a heart condition, supposedly. He brandished the letter. There had been something at the end about being medically disqualified. Anna hadn't read it closely enough to notice any details. You mean go to the war? No, oh, to the bloody circus! He scoffed. He'd been going on for months about what an idiot William was for wanting to enlist. Don't do anything hasty, she warned him. You're upset now, but I don't think they let you back out once you've signed up. I'm sure they don't. He sighed, seeming to deflate. I'm not going to do anything hasty. It's just... It's a lot. I'm sure it is. The young ladies were feeling the strain of it, too, with all the young men they knew going to war and the first news of deaths starting to come in. They got, I don't know if you've heard, but letters, too. But at least it wasn't all their friends going. Just their beau, their friends' brothers, their friends' beaux. Thomas's social circle, this wide-ranging, glass-spanning social circle that he had scarcely said a word about before now, seemed to be made up entirely of men, which she supposed stood to reason. Thomas sniffed and wiped his eyes one more time, pulling himself together. Carson's probably ready to skin me alive. I think Mr. Bates is talking to him, Anna said. You know, a lot of his friends are being killed, too. I'll bet they are, Thomas said, and he's not swearing at the breakfast table about it. I just meant maybe you should talk to him. <laughs> Thomas studied his hands for a moment. Maybe. Thomas braced himself for a lecture when he went inside, but all Carson said was that he trusted Thomas had brought himself under control. Yes, Mr. Carson, he said dully and went to tend to the upstairs breakfast. When he'd finished with that and went back downstairs, Hughes called him into her sitting room and poured him a cup of tea. He took it warily. Anna tells me you've been getting a lot of upsetting news lately, she said. He nodded. I'm sorry about the language. I really didn't mean to say it out loud. I understand, but perhaps it would be better not to open your letters at the table if they might be upsetting and you're feeling fragile. She had a point. Yes, Mrs. Hughes. And then Carson put him on linen pressing duty, which was easy and fairly pleasant work, and kept him out of the public eye in the pressing room, which was probably the point. A day or two later, Thomas got two good news letters, which put him in a much less bleak frame of mind. In the morning post was a letter from Theo. He opened this one with some trepidation. And in the boot room... Because Theo had maintained his stature as their set's one-man information bureau, despite repeated changes of headquarters, and thus sent an awful lot of letters that said, I don't know if you've heard yet, but... This one, however, contained the welcome news that Joey had been seen recently on his way back from a stay at a dressing station where he'd been with the fever that was going around. Theo theorized that his letters might not have caught up with him there if he wasn't replying. Apparently, that was known to happen sometimes. Theo went on. As for us, we're managing all right. We've had two spells up at the front so far, and nothing too dreadful has happened. 
It's terribly money, and the living arrangements don't even bear speaking about. But we and the chaps across the way have reached a sort of understanding about keeping the noise down, if you get my meaning. Right now, we are at a rest camp, which is not as restful as it sounds. If they don't have anything useful for you to do, they make you go out and play football, of all things. It's like being back in school. S. I'm sure we would all get more benefit from a nice nap. But there you have it. Syl is attempting to persuade the powers that be to allow us to substitute amateur dramatics for the football, which, as I'm sure you can imagine, is a great deal more appealing. We have no actresses, of course, but Syl has gamely offered to be our leading lady. He thinks he has just about brought them round to the idea, but it might have to wait for our next spell of rest. We've been told to turn out for parade first thing after breakfast in full kit, which is often all the warning we get that we're going back up. Car! This is me practicing my war face. Yes. Here there was a little drawing in the margin of a face with dark, heavily slanted eyebrows. We are well supplied with biscuits and cigarettes from Lady M. She sends us a parcel nearly every week, but still so would particularly like some lip rouge. The red in the vendor! And silk stockings for the play, if you have any idea where to get things like that. Somehow, the army has neglected to supply us with these essential articles. We will send you the money if you're able to find them. S. Much love to you and Peter from both of us, Theo and Syl. Thomas huffed a bit at the final request. No, he certainly did not know where to find stockings and lip rouge. He supposed he could ask Anna, though. He was glad they'd lucked into a quiet sector, as Peter told him they were called, where the Bosch were no more interested in being shot at than you were. Peter didn't spend much time in those, as there wasn't a great deal for the RAMC lads to do there, apart from collecting sick, but he'd said that often they'd even stop shelling when they saw the Red Cross, in return for the same courtesy when their own stretcher bearers came up. In the afternoon post brought a letter from Peter, which was even more welcome. It said, 18th of April, 1915. Dear Thomas, Sorry my last letter was so glum. I suppose I was mistaken about what Captain R thought, because he has come through splendidly. This morning he called me especially and told me that he'd been asked if he could spare a man or two to fill in on one of the hospital ships in the channel, and he immediately thought of me. Apparently almost all of the orderlies that normally work on it are down with trench fever, but they've fumigated the whole place, so don't worry about that. It just goes to show that you never know your luck. It really is a perfect solution because it's away from the sound of the guns, which is all I wanted, but isn't considered a plum assignment, so the other fellows won't mind me getting it. There has been some teasing on the theme of taking a holiday at the seaside, bringing back a stick of rock, etc. But a lot of them have admitted in private that they are afraid of U-boats and say they wouldn't swap with me if they could. I'm not worried. Hospital ships are exempt from attack. Dressing stations are supposed to be too, but I figure it's a lot easier to avoid accidentally hitting a great big ship with red cross markings all over it than a section of trench that looks just like everything else. Besides the U-boat question, a number of them were seasick on the way over. Luckily, I'm not susceptible to that. So that's another bunch that say, better than you than me. Captain R did ask for another volunteer, and eventually Isaac S. said he supposed he'd go if nobody else wanted to. It really is frightfully important over here that your mates not think that you are trying to shirk your share of the unpleasantness. But if there's something you don't mind and the other bloke does, you can swap it for something you mind and the other bloke doesn't, if you follow me. It's a temporary assignment, probably four to six weeks, which is about how long trench fever usually lasts. So I'll be coming back to my mates once the other chaps are all better. That's important. I wouldn't want to have to get used to a whole new group of people. I'm sure I'll find the guns easier to bear once I've had a bit of a break from them. We aren't leaving just yet. Captain R has to arrange the details. But we've been asked to pack our kits and be ready to go immediately when our orders arrive, so I think it's going to work out. I will only be in England long enough to unload the patients on each trip, but I will wave in the direction of Yorkshire. In the meantime, light a cigarette for me. Affectionately yours, P.F. Thomas happily reported this news when Miss Hughes made the now-routine inquiry after Peter's well-being at dinner.
He's quite well, in fact. He's going to be doing a spell of duty on a hospital ship. One of the medical officers recommended him for it specially. Where's that, then? Maud asked. In the Mediterranean? Thomas shook his head. The Channel. Will there be a chance for you to see him while he's in England? Anna asked. At the end of the day, Will Carson cleared his throat pointedly. No, Thomas said. They only stop long enough to unload the wounded, then turn around and go back for more. It's just as well. If they got home leave out of it, all of his mates would be envious of him being chosen for it. Why did the officer choose him, I wonder? Asked O'Brien, which is the hint of insinuation. Because he's very good at his job, I expect, answered Thomas. Anna, William said in an urgent whisper. She was on her way up to wake and dress the young ladies, but it sounded important, so she backtracked and said, I've only got a minute, can we talk later? Oh no, he said. But quick, what ship did Thomas say that Mr. Fitzroy was on? He didn't, she said, feeling cold. Why? He ducked back into Carson's pantry and came back out with a newspaper. The headline announced, German atrocity. U-boat sinks hospital ship Albion. Under that, hundreds unaccounted for. Oh, dear God, Anna said. They stood in silence for a moment until Mr. Carson bustled up and asked what they were standing around for. Wordlessly, William showed him the newspaper. Good heavens, Mr. Carson said. Will they stop at nothing? Still, we had best carry on. It's not just that, Mr. Carson, said William. We don't know if... Thomas's friend. It might not be the one, Anna said. He might very well know the name and not have mentioned it. But someone better break it to him gently, just in case, William added. Anna had a pretty good idea who that someone had better be. I have to go upstairs and dress them, she said. Can you keep him from seeing a paper somehow until I get back? Yes, said Mr. Carson. But if any of the family should happen to mention it while we're serving breakfast... Mention what? Miss Hughes asked, appearing in the doorway. Wordlessly, Anna showed her the paper. Oh, dear, she said. Is that... We don't know, Anna said. We don't know if he knows what ship Mr. Fitzroy's on. Right, said Miss Hughes. Shall I go up and sit to the girls while you speak to him, or would you rather I told him? Anna did not want to tell him. Would have much rather forced it off on Miss Hughes. But God alone knew what Thomas would say or do if it was Mr. Fitzroy's ship. She'd know not to take it personally, whatever it was. I think it would be best if I pulled him aside. If it's nothing, I'll come right up and take over from you. Miss Hughes nodded. If it is bad news, it might be best if he hears it from a friend. After getting Mr. Carson's permission to take the paper with her, Anna went to look for Thomas. No, oh, Thomas heard himself say. It can't be. There must be loads of them. It can't be the one. Peter had only gone on a hospital ship to get away from the sound of the guns. It can't have sunk. I'm sure there's dozens of hospital ships, Anna said, her face pale and worried beneath her cap. Yeah, Thomas said, trying to make himself believe it. It's awful, though. Sinking a hospital ship? That was what you were supposed to say, wasn't it? Have they no shame? His voice sounded distant to him, as if he were standing in the far corner of the boot room, looking at himself, holding the newspaper. Anna stroked his arm. Sit down a minute, she suggested. He shook his head. They'll be coming down to breakfast any second. I'd better get up there. That was what he'd be doing if nothing had happened, and nothing had happened. Not to him, or to anyone else he knew. I'm sure Mr. Carson will understand if you're not quite ready. If I stopped working every time the hunt killed somebody, I'd never do anything, he pointed out. Thomas sleepwalked through the day, trying determinedly not to think about anything. He only came awake to pounce on the post each time it was delivered, hoping for a cheery letter from Peter saying, I'm here on the something other than Albion, and it's just the break I needed. Or a frustrated one saying that his second mint had fallen through, or he was halfway to the port but kept getting stuck on railway sidings waiting for troop trains to pass. <laughs> Anything! The evening post brought a field postcard, which made his stomach lurch, but it was only from Theo. The phrases he'd left uncrossed out were, 
I have been admitted to hospital, wounded, and I'm going on well. And letter follows at first opportunity. On any other day, this news would have occupied all his attention as he tried to figure out what Theo wanted to communicate with his selections from the few printed phrases. Now he distinctly noted that am getting on well sounded like his wound wasn't serious. But in that case, why send Thomas a field postcard at all? It wasn't as though they wrote on such a regular basis that Thomas would worry if he didn't hear from him for a few days. That night in his room, he started to write a letter to Peter, passing along the little news he'd gotten and speculating about what it might mean. But he found himself weeping over it, and why he didn't know, and crumpled the paper and threw it away. The next day's papers had a list, a partial list, they'd emphasized, of some of the survivors rescued from the Albion. Peter's name wasn't on it. There were other narrowing details, too, that survivors had been rescued by two ships, a gunboat and a collier, but the latter had been sunk, as well, less than an hour later, that the missing included patients, the ship's crew, RAMC officers and men, and nursing sisters, that it had taken less than a quarter of an hour for the ship to go down. The story was on the front page of every paper going, and everyone was talking about it, but the conversations in the servants' hall stopped abruptly whenever Thomas entered. When Carson distributed the evening post, he very gravely handed Thomas a letter. Theo's handwriting. He took it out into the courtyard to read. Theo couldn't have heard anything about Peter before Thomas had. Could he? He had not, but what he did have to say was bad enough. Thomas. Sill's dead. I've been writing letters all morning, and every time I say it, it seems less real. I keep expecting him to turn up. We were out on a wiring party. You know, you go out after dark and fix the barbed wire in no man's land. It's not very dangerous if you're in a quiet sector. But this time they started shooting at us. I guess Jerry had a new officer show up who didn't like the sector being so quiet. Or something. The other bloke, you don't know him, was killed instantly. Still, I mean, never liked him much. We were both hit. Not too bad, I thought. Sills was in the leg, mine in the ribs. We crawled back to the trench, and while we were waiting for the stretcher bearers, Sill made a joke about being glad he hadn't gotten his new stockings yet. He ordered some from Paris. The parcel caught up with us in hospital day. They gave it to me, because they knew he was my mate. He was dead by the time we got to the dressing station. I didn't find out until the next day. They gave me something for the pain, and I was right out. It wasn't until I woke up and started asking after him. Bloody hell, Thomas, I don't know what the fuck we're doing out here. Pardon my French, so would say. Maybe don't tell Peter right away. I heard he was having a rough time of it. Theo. The first emotion to cut through Thomas's shock was relief. Syl and Peter couldn't both be dead, not at the same time. Life was cruel, but it wasn't that cruel. If Syl was dead, it had to mean that Peter wasn't. He said as much to Bates when he came out to check on Thomas. That was something people did these past few days. If he was out of plain view more than a few minutes, someone came looking. Usually Anna, sometimes Bates, occasionally Miss Hughes or William. Madge once. Sure, Bates said after a long hesitation. I'm sure you're right. For a moment, Thomas let himself believe it. He should have known better. The next day started with Bates racing off to London before breakfast. His mother had taken a turn for the worse in the night, and he was needed urgently. Thomas would have expected that to take everyone's attention off him, and he'd have been glad if it had. But Carson called him in to his pantry and asked if Thomas felt up to looking after his lordship while Bates was gone. Of course, Thomas said. Don't I always? Well, said Carson. I could do it this time, or William. Why? asked Thomas. I'm fine. Suit yourself. His lordship was surprised to find Thomas in the dressing room instead of Bates, but the only questions he asked were about Bates and Bates' mum, which was something of a relief. He was getting tired of being asked how he was holding up or if he'd heard anything. I'm not really sure, my lord, Thomas explained, getting out his lordship's tweeds. 
All Mr. Bates said was that it was his mother and he had to leave immediately. But the doctor telephoned before most of us were even up. Miss Patmore answered it. I think he'd have waited until a bit later in the morning if it weren't very serious. I dare say you're right. Well, keep me posted if he sends word. Yes, my lord. When he looked at the morning papers after serving and clearing the breakfast, he found that the story of the Albion, while still on the front page, was now tucked into a corner near the bottom. The new lead story was the Allied landing in the Dardalenes, followed by hand-wringing over the Germans' use of poison gas in Ypres. Thomas felt his sense of foreboding lift a bit. The Dardanelles were nothing to him nor Ypres. Peter wasn't anywhere near there and hadn't ever been. If the world was getting over the story, moving on to the next nine days' wonder, wasn't it likely that the war office had notified everyone that needed to be notified? It was a little surprising, maybe, that he hadn't heard from Peter. He might at least have dropped Thomas of Field Buzzgard. But maybe they didn't realize over there what a commotion the British papers had made over the Albion. Likely he'd written a letter saying, I hope you weren't worried. There are dozens of hospital ships and mine is whatever it is and it was held up somewhere waiting to be censored. Or maybe the letter had been on the Albion. Did they put posts on hospital ships? Thomas couldn't think of a reason why they wouldn't. That was a bit sad, thinking of a letter from Peter slowly disintegrating at the bottom of the channel, but not so very sad, and he had no idea why his eyes were stinging. When the back door bell rang, just after the servant's tea, and Thomas answered it to find a boy from the telegraph office standing there, he told himself it had to be for Mr. Bates, saying that his mother had died or had gotten better or had flown to the moon. Or maybe it was about Maud's brother, or Miss Patmore's nephew, or Davy Small, or God knows who. When the telegraph office boy said, It's for a tea borough, he very nearly said, may actually have said, No, it's bloody my mugs! The next thing he knew, the door was shut, and Anna was standing next to him. He handed her the telegram, still in an envelope. She tore it open, looked at it, and shook her head, tears shining in her eyes. Robert was on the telephone with the war office when Carson came up to the front hall and stood beside the dressing gown. Yes. Robert said, signaling to Carson that it would be just a moment. Yes, I understand. If something does come up, you'll keep me in mind. The fellow on the other end assured him that he would, just like they all had. After thanking him and saying his goodbyes, Robert hung up. Carson raised an eyebrow, and Robert shook his head. As the gong sounded, he trudged upstairs. You wouldn't think it would be so hard finding a way to serve your country. They took all the young men Matthew's age and even younger. The old Etonian... Newsletter said that almost the entire upper sixth form had gone. There had to be some sort of a place for an experienced officer, even if he was just a tiny bit long in the tooth. Preoccupied with these thoughts, he didn't notice if Barrow was a little subdued. After asking after Bates, there was no news. He said, I expect the other servants would be interested to hear that Mr. Matthew is headed for France quite soon. It might be as soon as next week. God, I envy him having the chance to make a real difference while I wait around here doing nothing. Well then, you're an idiot! Robert could not have been more surprised if Isis the dog had suddenly leapt up and torn down his throat. I beg your pardon! I mean it! said Thomas. What the bloody hell do you think is going to happen to Mr. Matthew over there? Same thing that happens to everyone! He's going to die! You envy him! You have no idea how bloody stupid you sound! You want to be grateful you don't have to go! Even Bates has the sense to realize he's well out of it! Robert stared at him. Thomas was wide-eyed and breathing hard. Robert's white evening waistcoat twisted in his hands. How dare you! Thomas took a step backward, the high color draining out of his face, leaving him even paler than usual. His mouth worked soundlessly for a moment, and then he said, oh, I'm so sorry, my lord. I don't... And then, to Robert's utter horror, Thomas burst into tears. It was, if anything, even more shocking than the shouting, and Robert belatedly realized that something must have happened to provoke such an uncharacteristic outburst. What in heaven's name was he supposed to do now? He barely knew what to do when his own wife or daughter started crying in front of him, let alone a footman.
The first step was probably to stop him sniveling into the sleeves of his livery coat. Robert found a handkerchief in the pocket of his day suit and shoved it at him. Sit down before you fall down. Thomas sat on the edge of the dressing room bed, twisting the handkerchief in his hands. After briefly considering the merits of slapping him across the face, Robert said, Pull yourself together and tell me what happened. Thomas's mouth worked soundlessly some more. I... He shook his head, fumbled in his coat pocket, and held out a telegram. Oh. Robert took it and read, Deeply regret to inform you, Corporal P. Fitzroy missing and presumed dead in wreck of HMHS, Albion, May 1st, 1915. Dear God, I'm so dreadfully sorry, Thomas. Crossing over to the sideboard, he poured a stiff whiskey and brought it back to Thomas. Here, yeah, this will brace you up a bit. Thomas knocked it back in a single gulp and dried his eyes. His voice absolutely flat, he said. I'm very sorry, my lord, for speaking to you that way. I hope you can forgive me. I apologize as well, Robert said. What I said was insensitive in the circumstances. He wasn't entirely sure what he had said. He hadn't really been thinking about it. But he knew he'd been annoyed that the army didn't want him back, a sentiment that could hardly be received with sympathy by a man who had just lost his intimate friend. We'll say no more about it. Thank you, Malone. He sniffled and looked at the glass in his hands as if he had no idea what it was for or why he had it. I'll, uh, I'll telephone the war office tomorrow and find out if, if there are any other details. Presumed dead, he knew it was the worst news to get for the glimmer of hope that it gave. Hope that was in nearly every case false. The army didn't say presumed dead, unless they had reason to. Thomas looked up at him blankly. Why don't you go anywhere that isn't here? To your room or somewhere. I'll ring for Carson and he can not sit in my dressing room and coffee. Finish things up here. I'll explain to him that you're in absolutely no state to be working. Not well enough to serve a dinner. And ask him why in God's name he let you come up here in the first place. Yes, my lord, said Thomas, his voice still expressionless. After a moment, he got up and left the room. Robert took a moment to collect himself before ringing for Carson. He'd have had a bracer himself, except that Thomas had taken the glass with him. The next day, everyone was treading on eggshells around Thomas. Anna and Miss Hughes kept patting him, and most of the others avoided so much as looking at him. Carson especially. At breakfast, when he'd been outlining the day's tasks, all he said to Thomas was that he had rushed him downstairs for the time being. His lordship had told him, of course, about what Thomas had said. Whatever he had said, he had hardly been thinking. Obviously, he vaguely remembered something about his lordship being an idiot and that he ought to be grateful not to have to go and get killed and several swear words. He supposed he ought to be grateful that he hadn't been sacked instantly. He felt as though at the slightest touch he'd shatter. If they'd tossed him out of the house last night, he might have wandered in front of an oncoming train or tripped and fallen face first in a puddle and drowned there because he couldn't remember how to stand up or why he might want to. It still might happen if they sacked him today. For most of the morning, he sat at the servants' hall table, staring at the grain of the wood in front of him. He was not at all surprised when, about midday, Miss Hughes took him by the arm and herded him into Carson's pantry. He might have been a little surprised to see his lordship there if he hadn't been too numb to feel much of anything. He stared at the blotter on Carson's desk, vaguely aware of Carson and Miss Hughes hovering behind him, likely in case he started shouting again. I spoke to the war office, his lordship said. It isn't good news, I'm afraid. How could it possibly be? It seems that all of the survivors have been identified. They are still looking for remains, but because of the speed of the sinking, they expect that a great many will not be recovered. 
Of course they wouldn't be. He wasn't even going to get a grave to mourn over and hadn't expected one. He knew he was supposed to say something now. Probably, thank you, my lord. But he couldn't manage it, could barely manage to move his head in something that might pass for a nod. As you're his next of kin, I'll send you any personal effects that may be found and any pay owing to his account. But these things can take several weeks, or even months. He managed another fraction of a nod. I'm dreadfully sorry about all this, his lordship went on. Just get on with it. But before his lordship could say anything else, Miss Hughes took him by the arm again, this time showing him into her sitting room, where he sat in a rocking chair and looked at the rug. At some point she wrapped his hands around a cup of tea and sat across from him in a chair she'd pulled so close their knees were almost touching. I know you're upset, she said, but you must go on. Mr. Fitzroy wouldn't want to see you like this, would he? Thomas thought of the time back when he'd been a junior footman at Lady Waterstone's, and he'd been upset. Well, no, he'd been crying like he'd been crying for most of the past day, although he'd had less reason to then. It was only his mother who was dead. And Peter had let him crawl into bed with him and sleep with his head on Peter's chest. No, Peter wouldn't want to see him like this. But he wouldn't mind, either. Not like that. Would it want him to stop because it was embarrassing for all concerned? He's dead, Thomas said. He doesn't get a say. In answer, Miss Hughes took his hands in hers and guided the cup, warm rather than hot, to his mouth. He drank because it was that or drown. He supposed that was a good thing to know, that he didn't want to drown. Is there anywhere, she asked when he had finished drinking the tea, that you would rather be right now? Anyone you might stay with for a bit? He shook his head. If Peter weren't dead, if the entire world weren't dead, he'd have an answer to that one. He'd go to London and see Peter. He'd even take Theo in a pinch, but Theo was nearly as far out of reach as Peter was. All right, then, she said. You'll stay here and we'll do our best to look after you. Thomas wanted to say that he didn't need looking after. No. He didn't want to say that. He wanted to want to say it, maybe. And I hope it doesn't need saying you're not to worry about getting back to work until you feel up to it. Here, he looked up at her. It felt like the first thing he'd done of his own volition since opening the door for the telegram boy. He ought, he knew, to communicate with his expression, and he knew perfectly well that, at best, he had a lot of making up to do before he could even think about begging to keep his job, and more likely they were simply waiting a decent interval to sack him. But he had no idea what to do with his face to express that idea. Or even if it was possible for a face to express it. None of us are heartless enough to worry you with any of that at a time like this, she added. Not even Mr. Carson. Some small part of him, the part where his survival instincts lived, a sort of low cunning, recognized it as an opening. They felt too sorry for him right now to make any decisions about his job. If he could somehow slide back into the routine of the house while he was still too pathetic to sack, the whole thing might just blow over. It wasn't much of a plan, but it was all he had. Now he just had to decide if he cared enough to do it. Drink or drown? And how is Thomas building up? Robert asked as Bates helped him into his evening jacket. Bates had come back that afternoon and they had discussed his mother's health. Improving, though apparently she needed a girl to live with her. In the earlier stages of dressing for dinner. He was in the dining room at lunch and briefly. It was his first appearance upstairs in days. It looked fairly ghastly. He's trying, my lord, Bates said. Soldiering on. Robert huffed, wincing inwardly at the choice of word. He wondered if Bates, too, thought he was an idiot for wanting to go back into the army. But to ask would put Bates in an impossible position. I hope Carson isn't pushing him to get back to work. I'd rather he wait a little longer than... Cause another scene put him under too much of a strain. He seems to be pushing himself, 
Baines answered. And it says Miss Hughes spoke to him about taking the time he needs, and that Mr. Carson hasn't really asked him to do anything the last few days. Having something to do may help in some small way. Well, Robert wouldn't begrudge him anything that helped. But he did wonder if he ought to be kept out of the dining room. He hoped that Carson would have realized that on his own, but Thomas was in the dining room again, a dinner taking plates away at one point, and at another bringing in a sauce. Thomas, are you quite all right? Sybil asked when he offered her the sauce. Yes, my lady, thank you for asking, he said in that same dreadful monotone he'd spoken in after he'd finished shouting at Robert. When the ladies had gone out and Carson brought him his port, Robert gestured for him to stay. I wanted to speak to you about Thomas. He glanced through the servant's door. I sent him downstairs, my lord, Carson said, understanding his meaning. Good, good. I'm glad that he's beginning to get back to normal, but I wonder if the dining room is really the best place for him at the moment. Carson dipped his head. I confess I did not entirely have the heart to tell him not to, but if his appearance is distressing the young ladies, obviously I must. Mm, I dare say we can handle it, but I'm not sure about the day after tomorrow when we have Sir Willingham Camberley to dine. With him being in the war office, there's bound to be... He paused to choose his words carefully. Talk of distressing subjects. Yes, my lord. I thought of asking if Mr. Morrisley could assist us that evening. Very good. I should have realized you'd be on top of it. Ah, uh, I don't suppose there's anywhere he could go for a day or two. If he simply happened to be elsewhere on the evening of the dinner party, Carson wouldn't have to attempt an explanation of why Mosley had been brought in to fill in for him. I'm afraid not. Most who has asked him several days ago. I thought as much. You'll simply have to think of something to say to him, I'm afraid. It would be cruel to put him in a position in which he might embarrass himself. I quite agree, my lord. He hesitated. And, my lord... Yes. Last autumn, when you said that I might come to regret it, if I prevented Thomas from seeing the man before he left. He hesitated. You were right. I would regret it. Robert nodded. I knew you would. Banished from the dining room, Thomas sat on a crate in the courtyard smoking and reading Peter's final letter. It had come a couple of days ago. The sight of his writing on the envelope had caused Thomas's heart to lurch with a moment's unreasonable hope that the telegram had been wrong. It hadn't been, of course. The letter had just been delayed. Peter had written it days before the Albion went down. Thomas had read it at least a dozen times already, like poking at a wound to see if it still hurt. 28th of April, 1915. Dear Thomas, I hope you felt me waving to you from... Crossed out. I was there earlier today after completing my first voyage on His Majesty's hospital ship Albion. We're back in France now, and I'm told we probably have a day or two before we go again. The job's just what I needed. A lot of hard work, but I'm away from the guns and the filth. It's been wet, and absolutely everything in our sector is coated with mud, from our clothes to our beds to our food. I hadn't realized how depressing it all was until I got away from it for a bit. A few of the patients brought the dirt of the trenches with them onto the ship, but most had been in a base hospital for at least a few days, and so had been cleaned up. We do little actual treatment on board. Everyone is supposed to have had dressings changed, medications given, etc. before leaving the hospital, so once we've got the stretcher cases settled in, the bulk of the work is simply distributing tea and cigarettes, reminding the walking cases about keeping their life belts on, and handling the occasional bout of seasickness. The men who were out of the woods, but going back to Blighty for a spell of recuperation, or for good, are in fairly high spirits, as you might imagine. It makes a nice change from the dressing station, where the patients are either in a very uncertain state, or headed right back to the trenches once they've been patched up. Before I left the dressing station, a magazine was making its way round our lightly wounded wards with an article by some bloke who claimed to have visited a RAMC field hospital in France. The RAMC doesn't operate anything but that name. It was either a base hospital, a dressing station, or a clearing station, if it exists at all. 
Anyway, he went on about the bulldog spirit of Tommy Atkins and his keenness to get back to the front as quickly as possible. Oh, how the men laughed. You could follow the thing's progress through the wards by the general hilarity it provoked. I will say of T. Atkins that he generally makes a manful attempt to conceal his disappointment at finding out his wound isn't a blighty one, and often finds some genuine consolation in reminding himself that at least he won't be leaving his mates in the lurch. Very rarely does he heave a bedroom utensil at the head of the unfortunate orderly who has given him the bad news. But the ones we get on ship have no disappointment to conceal, and it makes for a sort of holiday atmosphere. There are some quite serious cases, of course, going back for specialized treatment, but they are given buckets of morphine to keep them comfortable on board, and are more or less living baggage while we're dealing with them. The journey back to France is less fun, as we are occupied in cleaning up the wards for the next set of patient passengers, but it's not too bad. We've also got a decent billet in port. We're put up in the spare room of an old couple who speak not a word of English, but seem pleased enough to have us here. There's four of us and two beds, which they seem apologetic about, but we're all quite used to sleeping in our blankets on the floor, so having a proper bed every second night is a real treat, as is getting to sleep the whole night through. Light a cigarette for me. Affectionately yours. P.F. It was good. Thomas told himself that Peter had been having a decent time right before he died. As quickly as the papers said the ship had gone down, he not have had much time to dread it. If there had to be a last letter from Peter, at least it was one where he'd been happy and optimistic. It certainly didn't make it all worse somehow that he died just when he thought things were going well. And Thomas had managed to read it without crying this time, so clearly he was on the mend, which Peter would be glad to hear if he was in a position to hear or to be glad about anything. Finishing his cigarette, he went inside, wondering idly if he'd managed to eat much of anything at dinner. The smells coming from the kitchen were a tiny bit appetizing, so perhaps he would. But before he got to the servants' hall, Carson stopped him. Thomas, a word, please. Thomas followed him into his pantry wearily. As you know, we have guests to dine the evening after tomorrow. Thomas wasn't sure if he had known that, but he nodded. Was this going to be a lecture about how it was time to pull himself together? Since you are quite back on your feet yet, we've decided to have Mr. Mosley come and help out. They were running out of patience with him, more like. Shaking his head slightly, he said, Why? I mean, I'm sure I can manage, Mr. Carson. Carson took a deep breath. One of the gentlemen coming is from the war office. His lordship is concerned that it might be too much for you. Of course. That was what his lordships will say no more about it. It meant that they'd shuffle him off the scene, replace him with Mosley, of all people, but not actually say why. I see. It would also like you to know that... Carson hesitated. There is no hurry for you to be back on duty in the dining room. He paused again and added in a warning sort of tone, I hope you know it was very kind of him to think of you. Likely his lordship could barely stand to look at him. Thomas wouldn't exactly want to look at him either if there was any room in his heart for humiliation over the scene he'd caused. Yes, Mr. Carson. Not very well. Carson gestured for him to go, and Thomas went. Dinner tasted like cardboard and back in his room for the night he wrote letters to Theo and Lysel telling them the news. He left it far longer than he should have, but he just hadn't been able to face it. Neither letter was his best literary effort. He simply said that Peter had been on the Albion, and that he'd had an official telegram. To Theo he managed to add something about being sorry about Syl, but at least it was done. He'd closed that chapter of his life, time to start thinking about the next. The trouble was, he'd grown used to thinking about his problems by writing about them to Peter. It would be so much easier to decide what to do about Peter being dead if he could just ask Peter. He actually got out a piece of paper and started, thinking it might help to pretend. But just writing the words, Dear Peter, gave him an ache in his throat. He crumbled up the paper and tossed it away. It wasn't actually sacked yet was one thing Peter would point out. 
At least no one had said so, and that meant there was room to maneuver. Mosley couldn't be his permanent replacement. He already had a job at Miss Crawley's house. He could conceivably throw himself into his work, the part of it he wasn't forbidden to do, and make some sort of apology to his lordship and just possibly hold on to his job. It seemed like an awful lot of work. But then finding another job would be even more work. The rest of his life stretched out in front of him, blank and hollow. God, if he was unlucky, he could live another fifty years. And he couldn't imagine enjoying any of them. It wasn't until the next morning, after a long and restless night, that it occurred to him that there was a simple and obvious solution to the problem of a blank and empty life.